Hey, welcome to City on a Hill Church Online. My name is Pete Anderson, uh, pastor here at the church, and it's a joy to welcome you to our Church Online experience. If you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. And for those who are regular, great to have you connected. We consider you as part of our church. And uh, we, we love the Bible. For us, it's life-giving. It's the very Word of God. And we find that as, when we unpack the Bible, when we take time to look at it and seek to understand it, we've discovered that God speaks through the Bible. It's incredible. It's like no other book. And I encourage you, if you, if you don't read the Bible, if, you're not, if that's not a regular part of your life, I encourage you, pick up a Bible. And every time you read it, say, God, would you speak to me? He does. He speaks through this book. It is God-inspired. It's life-changing. And I believe it will be life-changing for you. We're going to go today and we're going to look at Jesus Christ. And I know that God is going to help us by his spirit. So I'm, I'm here, right here in Edinburgh. Wherever you are, I know that God is with you where you are. Let's pray and let's ask God to speak to us. Lord, thank you that you're with us just now. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your love. Thank you for your love and plans that you have for every person listening or connecting today. My prayer is that you would speak to us just now. Come Holy Spirit, help me to share, help us to hear. As we look at some great verses, as we look at some great themes, I pray you'd make yourself very real in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, S someone uh, once said, I ended up sitting next to an insurance salesperson at a Robbie William concert last night. And through it all, he offered me protection. <laughs> okay. The thing about Jesus is that through it all, he offers you and me protection. When we describe Jesus, there's different ways you could describe him. You could describe him as savior. That's describing, this is what he did for you. 2,000 years ago, he died in your place on a cross. And on the third day, he rose again. He's savior. He died to save you. You could call him redeemer. You know, he, he, through his price that he paid, through his blood that was shed on the cross, he's redeemed you. He's ransomed us from a life of slavery to a life of freedom, spiritual freedom, free from Satan, free from death, free from sin, set free by Jesus through the ransom he paid. So he's our savior, he's our redeemer. That's describing what he did for us in the past. But what's he currently doing for us today? Right now, what's he doing for us? And Today in this message, I want to unpack for you something that isn't often talked about in the church, but it's such an amazing life-giving truth that currently he is your high priest who currently is interceding on your behalf and on my behalf. He's currently, right now, offering you ongoing protection. That's the great truth we're going to look at. So let's start there. Let's define what we're talking about. Jesus is the high priest. What do we mean by high priest? Well, if you go back into the Old Testament in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, God's people, the Jewish people, had priests. And the priests would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people to God. The priests were almost intermediaries between heaven and earth, helping bridge the gap between God's people and God himself. Now, the word priest in the Hebrew language that the Old Testament is written in is the Hebrew word kahan. And it means one who mediates, one who intervenes in a dispute in order to bring agreement or reconciliation between two parties. So a priest is someone who stands in the gap between heaven and earth, between God and man, bridges that gap, helps us connect, who makes atonement, who makes it possible for us to connect, who brings peace between two factions. And you think, actually, this is, this is the problem in humanity, that we are divided from God. One of the most ancient parts in the Bible is the book of Job. And in Job, he describes the situation we are in. He says in Job chapter 9, verse 33, in his cry to God, he said, if only there was someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together. Job was aware that, man, there's a gap between me and God. And he's saying to God, if only there was someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together. And you see, Job understood what actually we are all in that same situation. He understood the condition of human beings, that there is a gap between us and God. There is a chasm and it's called sin. Another word that's another way of understanding the word priest is its Latin word, the Latin word pontifex. And it translates bridge builder. Jesus is our bridge builder. 
he is the one, he's the answer to Job's prayer. He is the one that, you know, in the Old Testament, all, all those priests who represented us to God, they were just foreshadowing the coming of the ultimate priest, the ultimate high priest, Jesus Christ, who was going to stand on our behalf before the Father and build a bridge between us and God. Let me describe to you the historical situation we're in. Going back to the very beginning of time, human beings rebelled against God. Originally, we were created to have this relationship with God. It was like there was this bridge between us and God. We were in continual relationship with him. But then we rebelled. It's recorded three chapters into the Bible, Genesis chapter three. We call it the fall of man, where all of a sudden, instead of being in relationship with God, that bridge has now been broken. There's this chasm between us and God. And between us and God, there's this chasm, and that chasm is called sin. It's our rebellion. It's our desire to do things our way. It's our desire to live without God and, to be honest, be our own gods. And so there was a gap gulf. But what Jesus did 2,000 years ago is he bridged that gap. When Jesus Christ came, he was born of a virgin. He lived fully human and fully God. God became a man. And Jesus lived sinless. Unlike any of every single one of us who have sinned, Jesus lived sinless. And when he died in that cross, he wasn't paying the price for his own sins. He was paying the price for your sins and my sins. Our rebellion against God was paid for 2,000 years ago on a cross. And in that moment, he was bridging the gap. It's like the cross stands as a, ca- uh, as a bridge across that chasm that separated us from God. Jesus Christ's cross becomes the bridge across that chasm because he paid the price for our sin. He atoned for our sin. And through Jesus and through his cross and through his resurrection, we now have this amazing access to the Father himself. The bridge has been built. Jesus has become our means of accessing the Father. This is incredible. This is what Jesus did for us. Now, I mean no offense to my dear friends from, who come from a Catholic background, but the Catholic tradition would say that today we confess our sins to priests who are human beings. But that's Old Testament thinking. That's, that's like the, the Jewish people in the Old Testament did. That's done away with. Because 2,000 years ago on a cross, Jesus bridged the gap. So Jesus has become our great high priest, the one through whom we access the Father. So all of a sudden, we don't need a a human intermediary. We now have Jesus Christ, who is that great high priest. It says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 14 to 16, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What the Bible is saying here is that, that Jesus is the great high priest, that he is the one that we can believe in, he's the one who came for us. He's the one whose blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. That gulf has been spanned through the cross. And I encourage you today, if you haven't yet trusted in Jesus, if you're not yet in a relationship with God, today put your faith in the one, Jesus, who died for you, who rose again, and through his death and resurrection, you can now be in relationship with God. And he invites you now to draw near, go across that bridge, come into that relationship with the Father, draw near with confidence before that throne of grace because of what Jesus has done for you. Not so long ago in Chicago, there was a conference with major religions of the world represented. And the conversation and the, and the conference was all about what are the differences between religions. And all the speakers from all the different religions <clears throat> were trying to prove one point, And their point was this. They kept saying things like this, that all faiths lead to God. They were trying to make it very amicable, understandably, and they were trying to make it out that all faiths lead to God. And they would also say things like, all religions are basically saying the same thing. Eventually, one Christian professor, a Dr. Joseph Crook from Boston, stood up and he posed a question to the audience. He said, gentlemen, I beg to introduce you to a woman with great sorrow. Blood stains are on her hands and nothing will remove the blood stains. The blood is that of murder and nothing will take away the stain. 
she has been driven to desperation in her distress. Is there anything in your religion that will remove her sin and give her peace? A hush fell upon the gathering and he looked round the crowd waiting for someone to respond. No one answered. Raising his eyes to heaven, Dr. Crook continued and he looked up to heaven and he cried out to a different audience and he said, I will ask another question. John, can you tell this woman how to get rid of her awful sin? He said to heaven. And he waited as if he was listening for a reply. And then suddenly he cried, listen, John speaks. And he quoted 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, your sin can be forgiven. And the reason that Jesus is the only way, and Jesus himself said that, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. The reason that's the case is because he was the only one qualified. He's the only one who's ever lived without sin. Buddha was a sinner. Muhammad was a sinner. They, they, they acknowledged that fully themselves. Jesus Christ was sinless. And he died sinless on behalf of sinners and therefore becomes the bridge. The bridge is the gap between you and God, between us and heaven. Jesus is the only saviour and his death and resurrection can save your soul. Isn't that amazing? I want to encourage you today, trust in Jesus to be your saviour if you haven't already done that. And the Bible says it describes this moment where we trust in Jesus. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we have been justified by faith, justified, that's describing this thing that happened to us when we put our trust in Jesus. We've been justified by faith. We put our faith in Jesus. We've been justified. And we now have this peace with God through Jesus. Remember, Jesus came as the mediator to reconcile heaven and earth, to reconcile God and us. We've been justified. What does that mean? Well, justification is a courtroom language. It's like a judge has declared something about us. And to be justified means that the judge has declared us innocent. It literally means to declare someone as righteous, to, de to accept someone as righteous, to treat someone as righteous. And this is the truth, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, we're no longer interacted by, with God to us. He no longer interacts with us based on our sin. He now interacts with us based on Jesus. And the price that Jesus paid means that we've been justified as we trust in Jesus. He now treats us as righteous. He accepts us as righteous. He declares us to be righteous. Even though, sometimes I don't act righteously. Sometimes I don't think thoughts that are righteous thoughts. Sometimes my attitude isn't righteous. And yet, he declares me righteous. That's amazing. That's the incredible truth. If you were an ex-convict, you'd be convicted of your crime. You might have to go to prison. Maybe, maybe some of you have. And you spend time in prison to pay the price for the crime you committed. But even once the price has been paid for your crime and you're released from prison, for the rest of your days, you have a criminal record. But the incredible thing with God is this. When you come to Jesus and you ask forgiveness and you turn your life over to him, he declares you righteous. He declares you innocent. He forgives your sins and he declares you righteous. But he also clears your record. He, it's like you've never done it. It's like there is no more record because his record, his perfect record has been swapped with ours. Our imperfect record was placed on Jesus and he suffered and died in our place. And his perfect record is now attributed to us. So we're declared righteous. You can understand justification as this, just as justify, just as if I never sinned. Just as if I never sinned, even though I have, even though I so often get it wrong, we've been justified and have been declared righteous by God. He was punished so that you will never be punished. He was condemned so that you will never be condemned. He became sin so that we become the righteousness of God. Amazing. Now, justification is what God did for us, past tense, on the cross. He died in our place. But intercession is what he now does for us. So let me talk to you about that. Jesus is my intercessor. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. 
Therefore, God is able to save forever those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. When you're saved, you're saved forever. <laughs> Isn't that great? He is able to save forever. It's not like, all right, how do I be saved forever? Okay, I just don't let go of God. Well, it sounds like it's the other way around in this verse. It says, he is able to save forever. It's not your grip on God, it's God's grip on you. And it says, how do you know he's able to save forever? Because he always lives to make intercession for them. The reason you know that you're saved forever is because Jesus right now, he didn't just die for you in the past, he currently is interceding for you. What is intercession? Well, it's Jesus interceding on our behalf to the Father. Just like a parent would intercede on behalf of their children to a teacher. Or an estate agent would intercede on behalf of the buyer to the seller. Jesus is interceding on our behalf. And here's the question. You know, why is he interceding for us if we've already been justified? You know, if we've already been declared innocent and righteous before God, why is he interceding for us? Why is that even necessary if we've already been declared righteous? Well, here's my question to you. Since you came to Jesus, have you sinned? I mean, since you've been declared righteous, since you've, your sins have been forgiven, since you've been born again, since you were saved, have you sinned since then? Is it, is, it like, is it like since then you haven't once sinned? I mean, for me, yeah, I've sinned and I regret it deeply. I mean, I think I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus and I shouldn't sin and yet I sin. And you're a follower of Jesus and you shouldn't sin and yet we sin. So the answer to the question is why is, why if, if God justified us, why is, Jesus ne why is it necessary for Jesus to intercede for us? The answer is because we continue to sin. Jesus continued to intercede from heaven because we continue to fail on earth. Our sinning is continual, and so his intercession is continual on our behalf. Here's a great illustration of this in Exodus chapter 17, verses 10 to 11. We read that Joshua fought against the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, her, and Aaron went up on top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. It's an unusual set of verses. What was going on here is that there was a battle going on. Joshua and the people of Israel were fighting against the Amalekites, which was a, a very evil, wicked tribe. And they were having this battle in the valley. And as this battle was going on in the valley, Moses was up in the mountainside interceding on behalf of Joshua. And it says, as, as long as Moses' arms were raised, then the battle was being won. And whenever his arms were being lowered, that that battle was being lost. This is a picture for our lives. It's a historical event, but it also acts as a picture for our lives. Amalek or the Amalekites is always in the Old Testament a picture of the flesh. And the truth is this, when you came to God, when you trusted in Jesus, something changed so deep within you, but you still got the same flesh. You still have the same dumb thoughts. You still get the crazy emotions. And the truth is this, we're battling against the flesh. We're battling against our depraved nature. We're battling against those crazy things that go on in our souls that we so often think, man, I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be thinking like that or acting like that or speaking like that. That's the battle we've got in our lives. But the good news is that we're not alone in this battle. Jesus Christ, our intercessor, the high priest, is constantly interceding for us on the mountaintop. And as long as he's interceding for us, you have confidence that you can win the battle, that you will not succumb, you will overcome, and that these battles will actually cause you to turn to God and be changed in the process. Jesus is interceding for you. Here's another example where Peter the Apostle has this interaction with Jesus on the night that he's betrayed. All the disciples were saying, we won't abandon you, Jesus. Peter the Apostle himself very boldly and belligerently says, Jesus, even if everyone else abandons you, I will not deny that I know you. I'll, I will not abandon you. And Jesus then gave Peter this very sobering truth. He said, Peter, I'm telling you, tonight before the cock crows, you're going to deny three times that you even knew me. And Peter said, no way. And Jesus said this to him. Listen to what he says. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you 
Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus is saying, I know full well you're going to deny me. And just like when he accepts us and saves us, he knows full well. For many points in our life, maybe several times a day, for the rest of our lives, we're going to sin. We're going to get it wrong. That doesn't justify it. That doesn't make it okay. No way. It's not okay. But he's under no illusion that we're going to live these perfect lives. And he says to Peter, you're going to blow it. But he said to him, but I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have returned, strengthen your brothers. That your faith will not fail. His behavior fails and failed and failed. Look through the New Testament. Peter kept blowing it. Many times in the New Testament, Peter blew it. His behavior failed, but his faith didn't fail. And that's the amazing thing. You see, you and I are saved by our faith in Jesus. But the good news is this, you haven't lost your faith. Sometimes your behavior doesn't line up with your faith. Sometimes your actions or your thinking doesn't line up with your faith, but your faith hasn't failed. Why has your faith not failed? Answer, he's interceding for you. He's interceding for me. Your faith hasn't failed because he upholds that faith of yours. That saving faith continues to be saving faith in your soul because he makes sure it is. I love that. Listen to this quote by John Piper. I absolutely love this quote. Let the truth of this quote sink in. Our assurance isn't that God will save us even if we stop believing, but that God will keep us believing. Let me say that again. Our assurance isn't that God will save us even if we stop believing, but that God will keep us believing. You see, apparently faith is a gift and God gave me this gift of faith and I trusted in Jesus. But he didn't just give it to me like when I was 15, way back 30 years ago. He, every day since then, he's continually given me that gift of faith. Today, I believe that Jesus is Savior. I believe he rose from the dead. I believe he's alive. I don't just think that. I'm not wishing for it. I kind of know it. And I can't prove it to you. I just know that's true. If you hold a gun against my head and say, deny the truth of Jesus' resurrection, I'd have to say, shoot. I can't deny it. I know what I know. It's the truth. It's faith. And this is a gift from God. It came to me when I was 15. And every day since then, I haven't been perfect. I've made many mistakes. But what I do know is this. I still believe he's the Lord. I trust him as my savior. And that faith hasn't failed. Why? Because Jesus is interceding for me. And Jesus is interceding for you. I love that. Another great example in the Bible of how this intercession impacts us today. Going back to the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, we find the first record of the first murder on planet Earth. And this is when Cain murdered his brother Abel. And God then comes to Cain and challenges him about his behavior. In Genesis chapter 4, and we read in verse 10, the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the grounds. God was saying to Cain that your brother's blood cries out to me from the grounds. You see, blood, when it's shed, always cries out for mercy, sorry, for justice. Always cries out for justice against the perpetrator every time. Now with that in mind, come with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23 to 24. It says, you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What it's saying here is that there was another point when blood was shed. And also, just like Abel's blood spoke of the injustice that took place, so too the blood of Jesus, when it was shed 2,000 years ago on a Roman cross, that that blood speaks, and it speaks very loud. In fact, it speaks better than the blood of Abel. You see, the blood of Abel cried out for justice against the sinner. But the blood of Jesus cries out mercy for sinners like you and I. And this is the truth, that that blood continually cries out for mercy in the presence of the Father. John the Apostle, in 90 AD, this is like 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus, has this vision of heaven. And in the vision of heaven, he sees Jesus, and this is how he describes him. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Then I saw a lamb 
looking as if he had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne. It's interesting, when Jesus rose from the dead, he was able to show his disciples the scars on his wrists and the side. Isn't it interesting that he, who could open blind eyes and could cause lame people to walk and who could restore full health and well-being to a leper, he chose to allow in his resurrected body there to be scars. He chose that. He could have miracled them away and yet he allowed the scars to remain. And I assume, therefore, that his scars remain to this day in heaven. And when John sees Jesus, he says, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. This was now 90 AD, 60 years after the resurrection. And this is what I conclude. When he saw Jesus in heaven, he saw a lamb as if slain. The wounds are fresh. They're a constant testimony in the presence of the Father that cries out, mercy for the sinner, mercy for the sinner. Mer they've sinned again, mercy for the sinner. They've acted wrong again, mercy for the sinner, mercy for the sinner mercy for the sinner. That is a perpetual intercession that's going on in the presence of the Father for you and for I. Romans chapter 8 verse 33 to 34. Who will bring a charge against God, against those whom God has chosen? God is the one. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who is raised to life and is at the right hand of God is, and is also interceding for us. Of all the ones who could condemn us, the only one who could is Jesus Christ. And yet, what's he doing? Well, far from condemning us, he died to justify us and he's now continually, he, that's the past, he died to justify and continually today is interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. Righteousness, declared righteous, forgiven, here's my scars, forgive, forgive, show mercy, bless. You see, intercession is him constantly pressing the reset of justification in the court of heaven, constantly pressing that reset of the justification in the court of heaven. You see, his heart is for us, and it was his heart that was for us that led him to the cross in the first place. And it was, heart, it was his heart that is for us currently that causes him to intercede for us today. His passion hasn't cooled down. That same passion that took him through the cross, his willing, I'm going to die for this world because I love them, is that same bursting passion in his soul just now is constantly interceding for you and for I. On earth, he is for us. On the cross, he is for us. Currently in heaven, he is for us. The author, the author Steve Winger, describes his final exam in his logic class at the university that he attended. And he said that the professor of this logic class was known for his particularly difficult and confusing exams. And this is what he said. To help us in our test, the professor told us that we could bring as much information to the exam as we could fit on one sheet of A4 paper. Most students crammed as many facts as they possibly could on their sheet of A4 paper. But one student, for the exam, walked into the class, put his paper on the grounds, and had an advanced logic student stand on the paper. The logic student told that student everything he needed to know as he went through the exam. He was the only student to receive an A for his efforts. And you see, the reason we pass is because he died in our place. It was him. He for me, he in my place, for me and for you. The reason I pass in life, the reason I leave earth and enter heaven isn't because I'm righteous in my own rights, but I'm righteousness with the righteousness of Christ. He passed on my behalf. And the, today he currently stands, currently on our behalf in the presence of the Father with wounds that he bore for us so that you and I will pass as we go through life. Now I've got two applications as we come into land. First of all, hold fast. <laughs> Listen to this, Hebrews 4, 14 to 15. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Because we've got this great high priest, let's hold fast our confession. For 
We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted, even as we are, yet was without sin. Because we've got this great high priest, because he has passed through the heavens on our behalf, because he is able to sympathize with us, hold fast your confession. Don't give up on your faith. Don't quit on him who will never quit on you. Hold fast your confession. Why, why can we hold fast our confession? Well, it says in the verses, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. <laughs> Some believe that Jesus in heaven is less approachable, less compassionate than he was when he walked on the earth. Some of you believe that. That Jesus currently is less approachable, less compassionate, than Jesus when he walked on the earth showing compassion to sinners. Not so. It's because he is able to sympathize with our weakness that we can hold fast our confession. You see, if you could take your hands and place them on the heart of Jesus, on the chest of Jesus, and feel his very heartbeat, and feel how his heart beats right now, 2022, not 2,000 years ago, but literally right now. Well, Hebrews 4 that we've just read there, verse 15, where it says he is able to sympathize. That's your stethoscope. You can place it in the heart of Christ. How is he feeling today? He is able to sympathize with our weakness. That's the heart of Christ. Our natural intuitions tell us that when everything's going well in our life, that when we're doing well, when we're behaving ourselves, that then Jesus is with us, on our side, helping us when life is going well. But actually, this text tells us the opposite, that it's when life is not going well, that he, right then, right then, when you've blown it, when you've made the mistake, right then, his heart is able to sympathize with us in our weakness. That's not an excuse for sin. I mean, that's a very warped thing. If you make that an excuse for sin, you're warped. That's an excuse to be really grateful and hold on to your faith. And the final thing I want to say is, draw near. That's the second thing the verse says. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Then it says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's draw near with confidence because we have this merciful, patient, gentle, loving, for us, Savior, High Priest, Jesus. Because of that, let's draw near. And, and actually, that goes against the grain with us because when we've blown it, we want to hold back because we've blown it. But Jesus says, no, no, when you've blown it, draw near. That's the point. Draw near to this throne of grace. When Peter blew it, I mean, Jesus said to him, you know, you're going to deny me, Peter. And Peter said, no, I won't do it. And, Peter, and he said, you will deny me. And I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you've returned, strengthen your brothers. Well, Jesus, that night, he did deny Jesus. And then Jesus was crucified. And on the third day, he rose again. And then in his resurrected state, I love this account in John chapter 21, where Peter meets Jesus. And Peter's gone fishing in John chapter 21. Why would Peter the great apostle, go fishing. And I think he went fishing because that was, the, that was what he used to do before Jesus. And I think he was thinking, he knew Jesus was alive. He knew Jesus was alive. But he must have figured he's alive, but he probably won't want much to do with me anymore. Because when he needed me most, I denied that I knew him. So I'm just going to go back to fishing. That's what was going on in his soul. But what does Jesus do? Jesus meets him. And he says to him, Peter, do you love me? And he said, Jesus, you know that I love you. How could he say that? Because his faith hadn't failed. Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you know that I love you. Three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? And Peter said, you know that I love you because his faith hadn't failed. Yeah, his actions had failed, but his faith hadn't failed. And here's the thing. When God accepts you, he accepts every version there will be of you every version of you. He's not just the God of the first chance and the second chance, but also the third chance and the fourth chance and the fifth chance and the sixth chance. 
He's the God of the umpteen number of chances. And Peter understood this amazing grace. This is incredible grace. God accepts, he accepts forever. You see, your name wasn't written in sand. You know, when the waves come and washes away that name, every time there's a temptation, every time you fail, every time you blow it, the, eventually the name is washed away. No, no, your name is written in concrete. And no matter how many waves hit that name, no matter how many times you blow it, no matter how many times you, you make a mistake, your name is solid because Jesus is solid. He didn't just die for you past tense. He's currently interceding for you. And right now, he is crying out on your behalf and he's saying, these wounds, declare them righteous. Your faith will not fail. Draw near. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for these great truths. Thank you, Jesus, that you are not just our savior who did something for us in the past, you're our high priest who currently is interceding on our behalf. And Lord, we gladly draw near to you. We, we have sinned. We continually sin. We make mistakes. We, we get it wrong. We have wrong attitudes towards people. We, we, we think wrong thoughts. We, we do wrong actions. We say wrong things. But I'm so grateful to you that you are consistent even when we're not. And Lord, it's not us that saves us. It's your goodness that saves us. And Jesus, thank you. You save forever those who come to you. And thank you that faith is a continual gift from heaven. We're so grateful to you right now. Thank you for who you are. Just where you are just now, why don't you take a moment to pray your own prayers? Why don't you take a moment to say thanks to him for who he is? Thank him not just for what he did for you, but thank him right now for what he's doing for you. Thank him that he's interceding in the presence of the Father on our behalf. And while people are praying, I want to give you this opportunity. If you're joining today, and you haven't yet crossed that bridge, that you're still distant from God. You've never put your trust in Jesus who died in your place and who rose again. Then why not today? Why not make the greatest decision? I realize we've probably talked about things, things that maybe seem complicated, but they're true. And I think in your heart, there's a resonance in your heart. You think, I know that's true. And you might not understand it all, but all you know is in your in the depth of your being, you know that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins and he rose again. But right now, come to him. It's time to turn your life over to God. Stop running from him, turn to God. So that's you, pray this prayer with me just now. And by the way, I think some of you have turned away from God. I think some of you turned away from God because you thought God had turned away from you. Not so. Some of you need to come back to God who have been away from God because you wrongly believed that when you blew it, that was over for you and that is not the case so right now whether it's your first time coming to you or whether this is you drawing near again this is your moment come to the father through jesus let's pray pray this with me just now say dear lord god thank you for your love for me jesus thank you for dying in my place on the cross i thank you that through that death and resurrection i can have acceptance and forgiveness i can be righteous and saved and right now I put my whole faith in you be my saviour I come to you I cling to you I trust in you be lord of my life from now on I pray have it all I'm now yours in Jesus name Amen as you pray that prayer, I know that God has heard you and he welcomes you as his own. You're saved, not by anything you have done, but by what he's done for you. And now I encourage you to continue in that faith, continue trusting. Can I also encourage you to plug into church? You know, if you're connecting and you've made that decision, please let us know you've done that because we want to do everything we can do as a church to help you grow in your faith. God bless. Thanks for joining me today.